All right, before we get started today, we're going to be talking about web services and email services and some of the advanced features of the Apex language. Uh, but uh, before we get into that, uh, what I'd like to do is to address a couple of issues or a couple of questions from yesterday that uh, I didn't have uh, complete answers for. Uh, the first question that I'd like to, to clarify was, uh, would there be a problem whereby if we're uploading a, uh, a large set of metadata uh, components whereby uh, possibly we'd run into the situation where uh, some of the components have been uploaded, the next request would come in, and then possibly we'd have sort of a, uh, a condition where our, uh, the request would be handled where it's part of the old uh, metadata components or old code and then uh, partially uh, new code. Uh, well, one of the things that, uh, that, that won't happen because uh, when the changes are applied, they are applied as a single, uh, a, a single transaction or a, um, as a part of a, a larger package. Uh, so uh, that, that should not be a concern. There's also a question about the uh, you know, could there be versioning problems? So one of the things that uh, occurs is that uh, as Salesforce moves from uh, older versions to newer versions, uh, we do a two-week or a, uh, uh, we roll out new versions of our software over the course uh, of two different weeks. Uh, so we'll update half our servers during one weekend and the other servers uh, during the, the next weekend. Well, that creates a condition where you might have a situation where your sandbox is at a later version than your production environment. Now, the only uh, issue that would pop up is if you created a component and then associated with the latest version. Uh, so for instance, if uh, currently we're at summer 09, uh, if we had our sandbox at summer 09, which is 16.0, and we created a new class and associated the version uh, of 16.0 with that, and then we uploaded it to a 15.0 environment, uh, that, would, uh, that would cause a problem. Uh, but for the most part, we do support backwards uh, compatibility, or for that matter, moving from uh, same orgs. So that, that's that one unique condition uh, that you should watch out for. Uh, where you create something during that sort of that transition week uh, and associate with the latest version and then attempt to upload it to a, uh, uh, an older version of a, a different uh, org. All right, uh, so let's, uh, let's get jumping into uh, web services. So we're going to talk about uh, a few different things uh, in this module. We're going to talk about creating custom web services. We're going to talk about doing callouts to external web services from Apex. And we're going to talk about that in two different contexts. Uh, one of the uh, ways that we're going to do it is by using uh, web services definition language, so using an external uh, WSDL compliant web service. And then the other way is to use a callout or do a callout to a RESTful web service. Uh, in addition, we're also going to throw in the topic of uh, asynchronous Apex. Uh, because it, uh, there are certain conditions that uh, associate web services and asynchronous uh, Apex. All right, so let's, uh, let's get into uh, creating our own custom web services within Apex as our first topic. Uh, you can create your own custom web service by creating a method and then applying the keyword web service to that method. Uh, what's going to happen is that you can then code some logic that will be callable from the outside, uh, outside uh, world. In other words, uh, some, uh, something like a, uh, a .NET server or uh, a, uh, uh, an AJAX and Ax, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Apache Axis uh, server. Uh, so any sort of integration, uh, web service compliant or web service uh, server can then do a call in uh, to your custom web services. Uh, so here we have uh, just showing you if we have if we created a class and the class contained that web service, we could then uh, access or download the WSDL file in order to import that into our Access server in Java or our .NET server 
uh, and then be able to then uh, do callouts to that web service. Uh, remember that in our use cases for the global access uh, modifier, uh, web services was, was one of the cases where we needed to apply uh, global. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, create a class uh, and uh, uh, set the access modifier to global. The web service method, you don't need to uh, apply the global keyword to it. The web service uh, implicitly uh, is, or it, uh, uh, it applies uh, the, 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 the global access control of the class to it. So in this case, uh, when we're creating our web service, keep in mind it must be, it must be contained within a global class. It will then uh, essentially inherit that, uh, uh, that uh, global access from the class it's contained with. Uh, let me actually, I'm going to uh, go back and just talk a little bit about this, uh, this uh, sample code. So creating a web service is, is, is really straightforward because uh, we simply apply that web service keyword. We identify uh, what we're going to be returning, what are the parameters for uh, when we call this. And then as you can see, uh, in this case, this is a very simplistic web service. But what it does is it generates a new job application where we're going to be passing in a, uh, a position, information about a position, and then information about one of our candidates. And we're going to return a job application ID. So one of the things that we do is we generate our new job application by instantiating a new S object. And then we assign the position ID to the ID of the position and candidate that we were received. Same thing with the candidate. Uh, and then here we're giving this job application a status of new. We're then uh, inserting this into the database as a part of our DML operation, and then returning the ID that we get back. Keep in mind that any time we perform uh, an insert uh, into the database, it automatically sets the record ID of that uh, particular record. Some, uh, uh, some conditions for creating your web services. Uh, web service methods must be static. Uh, they cannot be overloaded. So you cannot uh, create uh, different uh, signatures for the same uh, web service name. Uh, they cannot include a number of different types of classes, classes including exceptions, ma uh, maps, sets, matchers, or patterns uh, because of lack of uh, a SOAP equivalent for these. Uh, neither can a, a system-defined uh, enumerated list be used anywhere within there. Uh, also, th it says you can't use uh, the web service keyword in a method defined within a trigger. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but you cannot do that. Uh, and then uh, one last uh, limitation. This is in Summer 09, we recently updated or uh, increased the size of the messages uh, coming in and then also going out from 100K up to 1 megabyte. Uh, so we uh, considerably increase that size. But keep in mind, there is a limit to the size of that response and request. It is 1 megabyte. Uh, this, uh, it says here the uh, uh, methods exposed with the web service keyword uh, are executed system. This, this, this is really uh, uh, when you do not define the with sharing or the without sharing. But remember by default that our classes uh, run in the without sharing <laughs> mode. Now that being said, it says you can't apply it to the, the method. And uh, with sharing and without sharing are applied to the class. So uh, this is really true of all methods. But one thing that you can do is you can apply with sharing to the class that contains the web service method. Uh, and then it will run under the mode of uh, taking into account uh, the record level security. Okay, So this is, it's a little bit misleading, this, uh, this second bullet. But uh, uh, you can use with sharing on the class that contains the web service. And it will execute. Uh, uh, with the uh, record level uh, security. Uh, so if you don't, then it, it will run in system mode. In other words, it will run regardless of that. All right. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, introduce the lab exercise that we're going to be working on. Uh, what we're going to do is we are going to create a class and uh, complete a class. And that class is going to contain our web service method that we're going to be able to call. 
Now, one of the things that uh, we're going to do to make this uh, work is we're going to use an S control in order to call our web service that we create. So in our, in our architecture here, you'll see that uh, there's this S control. And the S control is going to be running inside of our Salesforce application. So one of the things that we're going to do initially is we are going to uh, uh, upload or, or uh, uh, load this S control uh, into our uh, orgs. And then we're going to make it available on a tab within our application. Uh, what it's going to do is that the S controls have the uh, uh, our Ajax toolkit. They uh, natively speak web services to Salesforce. So the reason that we're doing this architecture isn't necessarily because this is something that we would recommend. This is just something that gives us a very easy way to be able to call a web service. Uh, so if you did have a uh, application in which you wanted to, you know, for instance, create a custom web page and then execute some custom logic, do not create an S control that calls a web service. Instead, simply create a Visual Force page and call a Visual Force controller. We'll be talking more about Visual Force controllers later, but this is a bit of a hack just for the purpose of creating, like I said, an easy way to call the web service. Now, the way that this is going to work is that this is going to be an employee referral uh, web service. And so the idea is that perhaps uh, a person would want to Im Im uh, refer a friend to Universal Containers for a position. Now, the way that this S control is going to work is uh, there are two callouts that it's going to perform. The first one is just using our standard Web Services API to do a query. And we're going to do a query on the open positions within uh, Universal Containers. So uh, we want to be able to generate a drop-down list where we can list for each department here are all the available open positions at Universal Containers. Uh, once we've created that list, then the user will be able to select a position and then fill out the rest of the form and uh, uh, fill out the candidate information. Uh, what our uh, web service is going to do is that's going to then give the uh, person the ability to uh, call the web service and submit that data. The web service will be called. We will pass it that candidate and position information. And the logic in our web service is essentially going to be, uh, let's uh, create a new job application. Let's associate the position with that job application. And then if the candidate exists, let's use the candidate. So we're going to do a, a little bit of a lookup to see if this candidate has already exists within our, uh, within our database. If not, let's then create a new candidate and then associate that candidate with this job application. OK. All right. Uh, why don't we uh, open up the floor to any questions? And uh, uh, after we've done that, we'll then uh, We'll then dive into working on the lab. So are there any questions? Herman, do you have a question? Any kind of versioning for, for your, for say, the Whistle or, or your web services? Say, in the future, you want to change the uh -huh. web services. How, how does that work with existing consumers of your? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, the, hmm. So is the, the URL contains uh, a reference to the version but let me check on that. I, I believe what's going to happen is that when you create the web service, that will be associated with a specific version of uh, uh, the version of the application that we're at. Uh, in our normal or our, our standard web services, that's a part of the URL that you're accessing. And therefore, we, you know, we don't, uh, at least up until this point, we have not deprecated any of those yet uh, to, remain, uh, to keep the backwards compatibility. Are there any other questions? All right, let's uh, let's uh, do a recap of the uh, the code that was our web service, and then uh, we will talk about calling, doing callouts from Apex to external web services. First, I'd like to address a uh, a question that came up previously about versioning within custom web services that we create within Apex. Uh, within uh, Apex, when we're creating our custom web services, there is not a built-in versioning functionality. So what I'd recommend is that anytime you do create a web service, 
uh, and you want to create a later different version of it, uh, simply include that in the method name. So as a part of the methods that you're creating that are ultimately uh, becoming the web services, uh, you know, do a 1.0 version or a 2.0 version so that you can have multiple versions uh, of uh, web services uh, running at the same time. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the, the code that uh, we uh, implemented. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we did was uh, we created the signature for our web service. And here's our submit employee referral. It uh, uh, takes a couple of parameters, our position ID, and then a candidate uh, S object. What we do is we check to see if this candidate already exists uh, within the database uh, by doing a query in the database to see uh, if we find one based on that unique key. Remember that our unique key is the uh, last name and email address uh, concatenated uh, and then converted to lowercase. Uh, we then set our flag, uh, depending upon what, uh, what the outcome of that is. And if uh, it does not exist, then we insert the candidate. Otherwise, we utilize the ID that we got back and generate our job application. We use, utilize that candidate ID, uh, the position ID that was passed to us, and then we create the job application and use those as our, uh, the lookup uh, IDs for the, record eyes, for the records. Uh, and then ultimately we insert the new job application into the database. Okay. I see you got two queries that are pretty similar up there. Why would you need, why don't you just do the second one and then if it returns <coughs> null, then, uh, then where does it select count from candidate and then you select the ID? Why don't you just select the ID? Mm -hmm. Oh, why are we doing, okay, so why are we checking to see if any candidates exist? Then we are going out and getting the ID of that candidate, doing pretty much the same thing, but uh, selecting, selecting that ID. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure. Let me try and think about how we could do it differently. So if we selected, if we simply went out and selected the candidate IDs and returned a list, possibly a list of candidates, we could then check the size of that list and then check our flag or and then set our flag based on how many we got back. Uh, it seems plausible to me that you could code it differently. We're so going to run limit one and then you mm -hmm. just check if C is null. Right? And see, yeah, and see if we got it. Yeah. So Unless that first query is a faster performing mm -hmm. maybe. And then you, you wouldn't have to run the second. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, on, honestly, I'm not sure why they did it that way. It seems like we could do it a, a couple of, at least a couple of different ways. Uh, yeah, either by checking to see if we if we did get back a candidate, if we selected just one, or uh, if we selected multiples, was our size equal to zero uh, in the list? Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, not sure why they why this was written that way. So. All right, any uh, any other questions? Okay, let's uh, let's continue with the uh, the lecture topic. And let's go here to uh, making callouts from uh, Apex. So whereas in the last uh, section we created a custom service, a custom web service, and then we called into that web service, here what we're going to do is we're going to be the uh, client or the requester where we're making the callout to the web service. Uh, so, for instance, one of the things that uh, we might do is access uh, using uh, uh, this web service callout, call something like a, uh, a generic web service, something like Hoover's, which gives information about different companies, profiles of those companies. Or maybe here, the, the Oracle web service, maybe we have our own uh, internal 
Oracle application that we'd like to integrate with and uh, go out and request information from there uh, in order to integrate with our Salesforce implementation. So whether it's, a, it's, a, it's an internet-based uh, web service or an, uh, an intranet-based uh, web service, uh, we can make those callouts uh, from Salesforce. Uh, to create the, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about for doing those callouts is when we are calling a WSDL compliant web service uh, versus when we're doing a call out uh, for a RESTful web service. Well, uh, when we're doing a, uh, uh, when we're calling a web service that has an associated uh, WSDL, uh, what we can do is we can generate the stub code or the, uh, the client code uh, that would, uh, or the Apex code that we would then call in order to make that call out. Uh, so here, uh, what we can do is an alternative to generating an Apex class is to generate the class uh, from uh, the web services definition language file. We can parse uh, the uh, WSDL, uh, change a few things, and then ultimately we're going to generate that stub code or the proxy code that we then use to programmatically do the callout. Some limitations, uh, there's some considerations and uh, limitations associated with doing web services callouts. Uh, the first is that there are only certain ports that we're able to communicate with. Uh, so, for instance, uh, or, uh, those ports are 80, 443, and then any port between 7,000 and 10,000. When we are doing those uh, callouts, one thing that Salesforce prevents is sort of a wildcat or just a, uh, a callout to <coughs> an endpoint uh, that you have not whitelisted. Uh, so what we need to do in order to make this work is we need to whitelist all of the hosts that we would be doing the callouts to. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, what you need to do is go to Setup, Se Security Controls, and then Remote Site Settings, and identify the host that we're going to be able to do those callouts to. Okay. Uh, in this case here, there's a, uh, a company called StrikeIron, which has uh, sort of utility web services. Uh, in this case, we're uh, uh, whitelisting both the, the HTTP and the uh, HTTPS uh, uh, hosts. Another consideration is that sometimes there might be uh, uh, variable names that are keywords within Apex. Uh, we cannot use those keywords uh, in Apex, uh, for instance, declare a variable called upsert. One of the things that you'll see that we'll do is append an underscore x onto the end of that in order to give it a unique name uh, that does not conflict with the keyword. Oh. Uh, there are limitations as associated with our support for the WSDL schemas. Uh, so there are limits to the size, uh, the different types that we support. Uh, so we do support the elements and a sequence of uh, elements. Uh, what we do, uh, uh, there are many things though that we do not support. Uh, blob, decimal, and enum are supported for the call-ins, but not the call-outs. Uh, in addition, our WSDL cannot import, uh, do an import. Uh, yeah. There's also uh, headers which are available. Uh, the headers can be utilized to set uh, cookies or keys used in things like uh, setting up encryption. Uh, so we do have access to the input HTTP header and the output uh, HTTP header. One of the things that we can enable is uh, two-way uh, uh, two encryption uh, utilizing uh, client certificates. Uh, so what you can do is uh, at the API, which is uh, once again referring to Web Services API, so under Setup, Develop, and then API, we can uh, obtain a certificate that you could then uh, import over on the uh, uh, remote web, uh, web server application server that we're going out and contacting as a part of this web service integration. Uh, so uh, that is available to enable that, uh, that two-way uh, SSL. Uh, after we've successfully imported, our WSDL file. Uh, this is going to generate the stub class. This is the class that we're going to be able to call from our Apex code in order to do the web service callouts. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, here's some sample code. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is, uh, as a part of this uh, call out that we're actually going to be doing in class, we're going to initialize uh, the uh, login information. And then finally, we're going to do uh, the call out. Uh, in our case, it's a very simplistic uh, uh, call out in which we're, doing, uh, we're going to be doing an IP lookup based on a, a domain name. Uh, this is actually we need to uh, we need to update this. The uh, request size has now been increased to one megabyte. Uh, that's as of summer '09. Uh, there is a timeout associated with these callouts when we're executing them from Apex code. Uh, so an individual callout that you perform can be a maximum of 60 seconds in terms of us getting a response back. Uh, so it can be anywhere between uh, one millisecond and 60 seconds. Now, one of the things that we can do is we can do multiple callouts from a single transaction. Now, the timeouts uh, as associated with all of those callouts, though, cannot be greater than 120 seconds. So an individual one, 60 seconds, and then uh, the aggregate of all 10 or up to 10 of the callouts uh, cannot be greater than 120 seconds. All right, so let's take a look at what we're going to be doing as a part of our uh, lab exercise. Uh, we're going to be creating a uh, visual force, or we're going to be, uh, I shouldn't say creating, we, we've already have <coughs> it uh, created for us. Uh, our visual force page is going to call a visual force controller. So the purpose here is to create some infrastructure so that when we test this callout, we have a, a UI and then uh, the controller to do the callout. We're going to take the IP lookup.wisdl file. We're going to generate the stub code uh, for uh, first logging in to StrikeIron and then uh, performing the IP lookup, which is the actual uh, uh, you know, business thing that we're doing in this case uh, as, as a part of these web service callouts. So there actually is two. Uh, two things that are occurring here. So what's going to happen is the, the user will uh, enter in a, uh, a URL, uh, so a host name, and then we're going to go look up the IP address from StrikeIron using their IP lookup web service. Uh, the controller will call the stub code. The stub code will make the call out uh, via SOAP out over the internet to StrikeIron, return the results back. Uh, so that we can then display them back within our Visual Force page. Uh, one of the things that we do as a part of this design is uh, notice that there's a custom object called Strike Iron Info. What this is referring to is, is one of the things that would commonly be done within a uh, uh, within an application is to anytime you have the login ID uh, and password credentials that you're going to use to access that remote system, you would normally not hard code those into your code. Uh, you would normally store them in something like a, uh, some sort of file uh, so that you could then go in and easily change that without recompiling your code. And possibly you'd also make the go, go the extra step of encrypting that file. Now one of the things that we're going to do is instead of uh, taking the login ID and password and uh, placing it within our Apex code, Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to create a custom object which would contain the, the, uh, a record for each set of credentials, in which case we would have a username and a password that we could then look up during the execution of our code. Uh, in our case, we're going to be storing it in clear text for the purpose of this lab exercise. But keep in mind that there's also uh, the ability to create the encrypted text fields. So you could protect those values uh, uh, from being viewed by creating uh, a username and password, place them in encrypted text fields, and then in your Apex code, then get those values and then uh, do the callouts. Okay. For more information on Salesforce.com training and certification, please visit www.salesforce.com forward slash training.